Hey kids, it's Mr. Flyer here, hope you're well. And uh, welcome to another edition of Bike News. The month of May 2022 has already flashed by, would you believe? Uh, so it's time to go through what's been going on in the world of UK motorcycling for the month. So if you're interested in that, stick around and stay tuned. Okay, so in this month's bike news, I've got three copies of uh, MCN to go through and an Adventure Bike Rider magazine. And of course, uh, towards the end of the video, I'll be doing some more readers' rides and of course, parish notices as well. So stick around to the very end of the video for those if you're interested. Alrighty, let's crack on then. First story in the first paper, BMW Aeros spring into action. This is interesting, I, I, I love new technology. I don't always like it on bikes, but uh, but I love it when uh, new wacky patents come out and BMW have been, have been at it. Not particularly wacky, actually, it sounds like it might be might be a good idea, see what you think. So it says here, uh, BMW's aero is spring into action. How pop-out bodywork is the future of aerodynamics. BMW have filed a patent for adjustable air deflectors to boost comfort and improved aerodynamics. Deflectors are intended to be hinged at the front edges and sprung so that they default into the extended position. So these are like manual with springs. Um, press, as pressure gra gradually increases, they gradually retract, eventually becoming flush with the surrounding bodywork to minimise drag at high speed. What I like about this is this is something. This is actually using airflow to change the aerodynamics of the machine. This is something that's been used on airplanes, um, simple airplanes, for many, many years. So I love this. I think it's a very ingenious bit of engineering. Uh, when going slower, the deflectors would be fully extended to push air away from the rider, improving comfort. And above uh, and above the high limit, they'd completely retract to maximise efficiency. As well as pushing air away from the rider, the deflectors increase protection against water and dirt when travelling slowly. This is the clever bit. Potentially useful either in wet weather or on a bike like the BMW GS that might be used in mud. So, so there's a bit of a something that when I first read this, I thought, well, this is a bit odd. If you're going to have wings or something and they retract, you're going to want them extended at high speeds because that's when they're most most important. But this doesn't seem to be the case here. This seems to be uh, more about protection at slower speeds. So I think that's very clever. Um, be interested to see what you think. Um, not sure what they're going to look like. There's a, a bit of a grainy picture here of what looks like a BMW GS with them fitted. Uh, and they look like big flappy things out the side. Not sure on the looks. But the idea I like is pretty ingenious. All right. Moving on, second story, Sky High, BMW's new K1600 GTL LE tackles a two-day 1,024-mile trip to Scotland. And that's a big ride in anyone's book, isn't it? BMW's full-dress tour of the K1600 GTL LE, that's a bit of a tongue twister, uh, is certainly an acquired taste. Build by the company that is offering an intense riding experience and powered by a unique inline six providing almost 133 uh, foot-pounds of torque. It certainly stands out from other mile munchers. Well, I might disagree with that, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, ultimate luxury, our Sky Epic will soon find out, it says here. All right, let's see what their verdict was then. This is the bit that's interesting to me, because I, I love uh, these big full dress tours. It says here, 1,000 plus miles in just two days is a pretty extreme tour. That's true. But it just shows how effective the GTL is at munching miles. After spending nearly nine hours in the saddle for two days running, each morning I had no aches or pains and I woke as fresh as a daisy. Don't often feel that on a long, on a long bike ride, do you? While you could certainly travel the same number of miles on another style of bike, I, can, I can't think of one where you would arrive at your destination feeling as fresh and ready to go again. Well, I can, and it's called a Honda Goldwing. <laughs> it's interesting because this new BMW K1600 uh, has been launched this year recently. There's been lots of reviews, haven't there? And I mentioned it before on previous bike news about the bike, but none of them seem to mention the Goldwing. Now, it's not uh, quite as expensive as the Goldwing, but it's not far behind. It looks fairly similar. It's got a very similar engine in it. It's got an inline six. Um, you know, you kind of take your choice between the two. If you want these gargantuan tourers, then they're really the two that are in competition with each other. So I'm very surprised that none of these articles ever mention the Goldwing or whether the K1600 is better than the Goldwing. Now, of course, I'm a bit biased because I, I own a Goldwing. In fact, I came back uh, earlier this week from a from a big tour on my Goldwing. I say big tour, a tour around Europe on mine. I did over a thousand miles on the Goldwing with Mrs. Flyer on the back and a couple of pals. There'll be some videos coming up on those soon. Uh, and it was absolutely brilliant. It's what I bought the bike for. Super comfortable, um, amazing engine, really enjoyed it. And I don't imagine the K1600 would be any easier. In fact, I think that they're a bit more top heavy. Anyway, I'll reserve judgment because hopefully I'm going to be borrowing one of these in due course from BMW and I can do my own direct comparison and I admit of course I probably will be biased because I am a clearly I'm a uh, Goldwing fanboy but I'll try to be objective and uh, you know state facts if I can anyway there we go I just find it interesting that no one ever mentions the Goldwing in these uh, K1600 reviews all right next up 
Ready, set, scram. So this is the new Royal Enfield Scram 411. It's new, but is it worth it, it says here. And this is a bike that I've got uh, various videos on the channel. I'll put links in the corner if I remember to this bike. I rode it uh, just, just a few weeks ago. I really enjoyed it. Let's see what MCN said. Uh, who would have predicted that an air-cooled single-cylinder adventure bike would be one of the UK's best-selling models? That's exactly what the Royal Enfield Himalayan has achieved, steadfastly sticking in the top few sellers in, a class, uh, in its own class since it was launched in 2018. In fact, uh, last year it was only beaten by the BMW GS and shifted an impressive 1,079 bikes. So the Himalayan is a massive seller. This bike, of course, the Scram based on the Himalayan, just got some styling changes, a little bit cheaper, uh, and I think it actually looks better personally. I, I, I get that the Himalayan's rugged and purposeful, but uh, I didn't like the looks of it and just didn't really like it. This, I did like. It says here, uh, as your confidence increases, so does your corner speed, and that's when you spot the suspension started to show its budget nature with a wallow or two as the pace steps up. Yeah, I noticed that too. The back end, if you did wind it up through twisty turnies, did step out a bit, but uh, it's not intended as that sort of bike, is it? So I think we can excuse it that. Uh, it's nowhere near as competent as a dedicated trail bike, such as a Honda CRF300L, but it could handle a gravel road or a lightly rutted green lane, and I took it down a lightly rutted green lane. It's absolutely fine. And I think, it, I think actually, for a novice green laner, it would be a perfect perfect choice like something like the 300L is, uh, certainly more comfortable. Um, one area where the new Scram is sadly lacking is in the braking department. It's woefully lacking in bite and devoid of feel, it says here. <laughs> Blimey, and like it quite as much as me. The verdict, the Scram 411 may be a slow bike and fairly basic in its tech, yet like the Himalayan, it's also charming and fun to ride. And with a price of 4,599, that's the killer. I mean, it's an amazing price. It remains excellent value for money. So there we go. So yeah, they concur with me that it's excellent value for money, but they're saying suspension and brakes aren't too good. The thing that disappointed me on it was the fit and finish wasn't as good as other uh, recent Royal Enfields. Um, it just seemed like it was made on a different production line, well, it probably is, or a different factory, where they didn't have quite the quality control. And things like the exhaust, even on these pictures, look, it looks rusty. Um, I'm told that some grades of stainless steel lower grades do rust, or at least tarnish, whatever you want to call it. It's, you know, oxidisation, isn't it? Um, and I just don't think that looks great on it. So an aftermarket exhaust required, but uh, 4599, I thought it was a great little bike. All right, next up, last one in here, user-friendly workhorse. Kawasaki Versus 650 gets fresh looks and more tech, but is it a cut above its middle bait adventure rivals? Now, I would say no. <laughs> the Versus 650 has been around for ages, isn't it? And it's a great bike and, uh, you know, people love it. Uh, it's reliable. It's just, a, it's a good workhorse. And and with this um, fresh looks, I think all it means is it now looks more like the Versus 1000. I still, I never really like the looks of the Versus 1000 and I don't really like the looks of this uh, 650 now. So the looks wise, it doesn't do it for me. That's a personal thing. If you like it, all well and good. Um, so, you know, that's, as I say, just entirely a personal choice. Um, but when you put this up, uh, up against rivals like um, the Yamaha, Yamaha Tracer 700, which I recently rode. In fact, my last video was the Tracer 700. Go and check that out if you haven't seen it. I loved that bike, it was brilliant. And of course, the Triumph Tiger Sport 660. Again, I rode that uh, earlier in the year. I really like that too. I just think they knock spots off this in terms of tech, handling, and looks. Um, all similar prices, I think. The Kawasaki Versus 650 is 8155. Anyway, that's my thoughts. Let's see what um, MCN say. Dan Sutherland was the reviewer here. He says, think of the Versus 650 as the Volvo estate of two wheels. Decent build quality and chunky switch gear add to the impression it will deliver years of use with minimal fuss. I don't doubt that's true. Uh, it's not all good news though. At 219 kilograms curb weight, the 650 is a hefty lump. Uh, overtakes require at least one downshift and it feels wheezy at the top end. So not exactly a glowing review from MCN either. So yeah, if I was in the market for a mid-weight, uh, sort of upright, touring stroke adventure style bike, then um, I think I'd look elsewhere, maybe towards the Yamaha Tracer, uh, or indeed that Triumph uh, Tiger Sport 660, both brilliant bikes. All right, that's it for the first paper. Next up, a few stories I've picked out of here. What's the first one? anti tampery victory for bikers. Oh yeah, this is a this is a great news story. Do you remember a while back, uh, probably about six months ago, there was a lot of hype in the press, you talked about it here on Bike News, about the fact that there was potentially gonna be a law came in in the UK that stopped people putting aftermarket accessories and things like that on their bike. I remember saying at the time actually, uh, that I didn't think it'd ever come in. It was an unintended consequence of a law that actually was supposed to stop people uh, tampering with self-drive systems on electric cars. Well, I'm glad to say sense has prevailed. Let me read you what it says here. Campaigners are celebrating this week following the government's confirmation that proposed new vehicle anti-tampering regulations won't ban most traditional motorcycle modifications as originally feared, um, which is great news. Uh, a debate took place last week and saw many pro-motorcycling MPs voice their concerns and conclude with Transport Minister Trudy Harrison MP confirming that not only would any new measures not be retrospective, but should also protect the aftermarket, aftermarket sector, motorsport 
and heritage machines. So we're all off the hook, it seems, if you're into, uh, if you're into engines. Now, any measures would target safety and health, particularly the tampering and advanced and autonomous driving systems. So there we go. Uh, we're off the hook. That's great news. So all the people that wrote to me saying, oh, you need to make a bit more of a stink about this, we're done. I, I knew, it. I, I just had a feeling that it wouldn't come in. It was an unintended consequence of a, of a law and it has now been put right, it appears. So I'm, I'm glad about that. Right, next story here again, another, let's get some good news stories going. Uh, and this is one where, about Norton, you know, we've had plenty of bad news stories about Norton. I mean, let's start to get Norton bigged up again, because there are great things happening at Norton. Now it's been bought out. It says here, Norton CEO responds to a hundred million boost. Norton CEO, Dr. Robert Henschel, has expressed his delight at TVS Motor Company's recent hundred million investment in the British biking brand, TVS being the new owners, of course. TVS purchased Norton for 16 million in April 2020 and have already built a new manufacturing plant in Solihull. Fantastic. This latest cash investment was announced on April the 22nd. It will also have a major impact on the local area regarding employment opportunities. A significant number of jobs are expected to be created in the next three years, uh, both directly at Norton and indirectly through businesses involved in the production of Norton motorcycles. So that's uh, that's fantastic. Cannot wait to see uh, once they start getting produced, uh, seeing what the quality is like, maybe having a ride on one. Let's get Norton uh, where it should be, a classic British brand. Well, hopefully a modern British brand that is actually going places for once. How many rebirths have we seen of Norton? I've got a good feeling about this one with the backing of TBS. I think this could be it. All right, next up. Going the distance, classic adventure or sports, which puts the biggest tick in the touring box. Now this is three different types of bikes pitted together uh, to see which one wins on a, on a tour. So they've got the BMW 1250RT, which is the sort of um, boxer based touring bike, the one that the police tend to use. Um, Ducati Multistrada V4S, great bike, loved that when I rode it um, a few months back. And the KTM 1290 Super Duke GT, which is a sort of a GT bike. If you've not seen Lamb Chop's Rides recent reviews of that, go check those out. Um, he really loved that bike. Um, I think it looks a bit like a rhinoceros, but it is improving. Anyway, that's by the by. Uh, the reason why this one caught my eye is because I mentioned I was on a tour uh, earlier in the week. Well, I went with Mrs. Fry on the back of my Goldwing. Uh, I went with the, my friend Ian, who was on a Multistrada V4, funnily enough, uh, and his wife Helen was on a uh, Yamaha Tracer 900. So a similar sort of mix of bikes, almost. Um, and we all got far on, on absolutely fine with the different bikes, to be fair, although I'd like to think the Goldwing was the best choice. Anyway, let's see what, um, let's see what uh, MCN says, if I find the right page. Here we go, the multi runs the BMW RT so close, it says here, the employer maybe the RT is the one to go for. So the KTM is the thrilling sports tourer, no doubt about that, incredible engine in there off of the Super Duke R. Uh, the Ducati is the phenomenally uh, versatile and well-equipped adventure tourer, and the BMW is the definitive but slightly sensible uh, traditional tourer. It is, a, it is a nice bike if you can get around the looks, which I find a bit bulbous. Uh, the Multistrada V4S may be the best all-round tourer here, although only just. Uh, but the best touring brand, backed up by an impeccable range of luxury accessories, luggage, prestige dealers and more, remains BMW. And the latest RT 1250 uh, has underlined that once again. Well, again, I, might, I and Honda may take slight issue with that. I do think the Goldwing deserves a look in in these sort of things in, in terms of being, you know, it, a touring brand with an impeccable range of luxury accessories. So it definitely fits in there. So, it, again, makes my point about it not being mentioned. I don't know, I've got a bit of a beer mod bonnet about that this week, haven't I? Anyway, so there we go. They love the uh, new RT. They gave it four. They gave the Super Duke GT four, and they gave the Multistrada four stars out of five. So no difference there. But they've got to get the star rating, so it's um, a bit more granular because you can't tell anything from that. But uh, So what did we learn there? Yeah, the RT is a good touring bike. Well, I think we knew that anyway. Anyway, moving on. Generation Desert X. Now, I brought this out because I've often uh, mentioned that um, when it comes to these sort of off-roady, rally raid, Dakar-esque type bikes. I don't really like the looks of them, but this one is different. This is the new Ducati Desert X, and I have to say, even though it has got that upright Dakar-esque looks about it, I really quite like the looks of this one, and uh, it's a complete departure for Ducati. They've not done anything like this before, as far as I'm aware. I think it looks pretty cool. I think the headlights look great on it with those running lights. Fantastic. Anyway, let's see what uh, MCN say. The Desert X, or Desert 10, I suppose, represents all new ground for Ducati. It's a pucker-go-anywhere adventure tool that's as comfortable on loose trails and gnarly trails, or oh, loose terrain, sorry, and gnarly trails, as it is grinding out the miles on an epic continental tour. Yeah, this would be a perfect one-up touring bike, wouldn't it? The off-road influence on the Desert 10 is obvious. This is the first modern Ducati to feature a 21-inch front wheel and an 18-inch rear. The Desert X, or Desert 10, don't know which, chassis is all new with a slimline steel trellis frame and aluminium swing arm holding 46mm KYB forks and shock in place. 
both ends are fully adjustable and offer 230 and 220 mil of travel so uh, yeah excellent if you want to do a bit of off-roading as well desert 10 is powered by a liquid cooled engine lifted from the monster which is a lovely unit i rode that monster last year and i thought it was, it was really nice so it sounded good went well it's going to be good in here uh, peak power is 110 brake horsepower absolutely perfect for the road uh, how much is this do we know i don't know let's look at the verdict i do like the look of this i am gonna have to try and get myself a go on one of these uh, this this is a cool looking machine 14,095 just see the price so hmm quite pricey i guess for a I suppose you'd call it a middleweight adventure bike when you got it up against things like the Tiger 900, which is uh, significantly cheaper, I think, without looking it up. Anyway, what else does it say? Uh, at 14095 the Desert 10 is 1500 is uh, 1500 more expensive than the KTM 890 Adventure R, but it's cheaper than the Africa Twin Adventure Sports, yet more sophisticated. Well, wow. interesting it says it's more sophisticated than the uh, Africa Twin Adventure Sports, because that's pretty sophisticated, if you ask me. Uh, anyway, verdict. This new bike from Bologna seamlessly blends an on and off road ability thanks to its beautifully balanced chassis, superb electronics, and proven engine. Together, these elements make for a formidable package. Uh, many other adventure bikes are one thing or the other, either good on road or good off it. The Desert 10 is both without compromise, and that's a difficult trick to pull off. So they seem to really love it. Excellent. Have they given it a star rating? No, they haven't, but uh, certainly they like it. So yeah, I'll have to tap up my friends at Ducati, see if I can have a bit of a go on one of those. I like the look of that. Right, next up. Uh, great when it works. So this is the uh, KTM 1290 Super Duke R Evo, which is a bike that is growing on me. I'm often saying that I don't like the looks of KTM. I mentioned it earlier with the Super Duke GT, which I said looked like a Rhino. However, the Super Duke R has always been the bike that I thought, that and the, than the little um, 390, Duke 390, are just great looking bikes. And now they come out with this Evo version as well, with a nice sort of dark blue and orange colour scheme. It's really growing on me. I, really like, I haven't ridden it yet, but... Um, but yeah, maybe I should get a go on it. I've ridden Super Duke R's a lot, and they are they are lovely bikes. Now, of all the KTM's, uh, it's probably the one that I would go for. I must admit, although I, it's it's a beast of a bike, and I, I would certainly wouldn't get the best out of it. But it's a lovely looking thing, and it's, uh, it's just got a quality feel. Anyway, let's see what uh, let's see what uh, MCN say. The KTM 1290 Super Duke R Evo builds on the already incredibly capable Super Duke R. I am forever blown away by the standard SDR's ability to be so incredibly gentle around town with the power to pull your arms clean out of the sockets when you twist the throttle, and that is the fun of this bike. But not everything on the KTM has been good. Uh, just 290 miles into our time together, the engine cut out, the dash threw up a preload error, and the rear shock extended itself, forcing me to tiptoe the bike to a halt and switch it on and off again. Uh, that's not good again, is it? This isn't doing there. Uh, reputation for dodgy electronics any good uh, these electrical niggles are such a shame because it's an otherwise cracking piece of kit it's a brilliant commuter and it eats b-rows for breakfast but the fear of faults is always lurking in the back of my mind what a shame that he's discovered that maybe it's just that particular bike maybe you got a friday afternoon one don't know i'll have to borrow one myself let's hope it's not that one and uh, and see how i get on over a couple of week period if i can do that with you uh, with ktm i'm sure they probably will they're very nice people there uh, yeah lovely looking bike would you be interested in seeing me ride that i know it's not my classic sort of bike i'm more of a sort of um um these days retro uh, almost cruiser actually touring bike sort of fella and i'm a road rider and you know don't do tracks and all that sort of thing but i do like this bike would you like to see me ride it let me know in the comments below all right finally the mcn's then i'm actually um publishing this on saturday as you well know but i'm actually recording this on wednesday and i usually get my mcn's on a wednesday the postman hasn't been yet so i've only got the three to go through but i'll hold over this week's one until next bike news so you won't miss out if you're wondering why there's only three papers this week all right, first story here, street tracking live wire reveal. Now this is this is a great story again. You remember the Harley Davidson live wire, the electric bike, which I think they stopped making a while back, but it's the one that Charlie and Ewan did their, their trip um, up the uh, from South America to North America on. Didn't see that series, but it seemed to do quite well. Um, everybody seemed to think that that was a great bike. I never got to ride it, but all the reviews were good, except it was very expensive. Well, now Harley have come up with this thing. Um, it's called the Delmar, and it's set to cost less than that original uh, live wire that cost 29K. These are the first official pictures of Harley Davidson's long anticipated second generation electric bike, the Live Wire S2 Delmar, which in this limited production launch edition will cost 14330 Now that is a great price for a bike, isn't it? That's just normal pricing, really. Um, the S2 Delmar is an all new, simplified, and more affordable follow up to Harley's original electric offering. Um, it puts out 80 brake horsepower. Uh, via its electric motor so it's a, it doesn't quite work like that but it's that sort of feel um, and the battery is claimed to be good for 100 miles so it sounds like it's not necessarily going to be one of those absolutely incredibly fast electric bikes which is sort of the fun of them but with a range of 100 miles a good price 
80 HP isn't to be sniffed at, is it? Maybe it'll be fine. It's claimed to weigh just 199 kilograms, which again is another kicker on most electric bikes. They're usually very, very heavy. This isn't 200 kilograms. Is about, you know, is acceptable, isn't it? Not super light, but certainly light for an electric bike. The Del Mar Pitched here is the hand-built limited predict production one. There's only 100 being made, so you ain't going to be seeing one of these around. The more standard version is due to enter production immediately. Uh, and it's set to come to the UK next year. That is priced at 12,114. Here we go, it's getting better all the time. So 12 grand for an electric bike that I have to say looks cool. What they've done with the cooling fins here sort of echoes the old V-twin, doesn't it? Although it's not in a V-shape, but they, there's two of them and it looks, you know, kind of slatted fins. I think it looks great. I really want to have a go on one of these. Uh, I've yet to ride an electric Harley. This maybe will be the one, but maybe this is the, um, the mainstream electric bike that's one, going to win for Harley, and two, might be the one that actually wins for the market overall. Wait and see, I'm quite excited about that one. Okay, another good news story, bike sales booming, it says here. Bike sales are remaining strong with the latest official figures for April, 4.2% up on the same month last year, and a total year-to-date sales showing a 32.4% increase. Incredible. And last year was pretty good, if I remember right, during the lockdowns and things. Um, sales of mid-range 126 to 650cc machines are up 39% year on year and are led by the best-selling Meteor 350 from Royal Enfield, great bike, uh, and up to 1,000cc bikes are increasing by 37% with Su Suzuki's new GSX S1000 GT leading the way. Wow. Uh, if you haven't seen my reviews on that and you're interested, I'll put a link again in the corner to those. The Suzuki uh, S1000 GT is the um, one that be um, replaced the S1000F, the sort of touring version of the bike with the old uh, GSXR engine in it. Lovely engine, really smooth. Um, looks again kind of divide opinion a little bit i'm not a big fan of the looks of it but it's a lovely bike to ride and it seems to be selling really well so good news for suzuki great and good news for biking generally if they're if they're selling well this year oh here's a little story that was stuck out the way here but i thought i'd just mention it because this is again great news triumph's new colors is the is the title it says here triumph have revealed new colors across their roaster and rocket 3 ranges now i'm often moaning about triumph colors being a bit boring while i'm talking here by the way i'll put some pictures of these new uh, color schemes up uh, and uh, and saying come on triumph pull your finger out let's get some new colors well they've not exactly come up with hundreds here but they've got some nice new colors i particularly like the bajar or baja orange uh, bikes that they come out with and also uh, which i think is on the speed triple i also like the look of the new rocket as well um, but but overall looks great this the street triple is great in a black and gold now which uh, always the best color for a street triple anyway triumph have revealed new colors across their roadster and rocket three ranges the speed triple 1200 rs has a new matte orange option which looks great the triumph 660 comes in matte orange and gray the street triple 765 rs is now available in plain black and the 765R in matte black. The Rocket 3R has a new matte silver look and the GT version of the Monster Triple is now in both red and black and plain black. So did you get all that anyway? You will have seen the pictures. Hopefully you like the look of those too. So thank you, Trump, for listening. Uh, I'm not saying they listen to me, but listen to the market and coming up with some more colours. They look great. More, please. Right, another tech story. Now, at the start of uh, Bike News, I said I, I, I'm a fan of um, new technology when it's good and simple. This one... Well, what do you think of this? Let me let me read it to you and see see what filters through your brain as I, as I tell you about it. Honda Tech steers out of danger. Uh, the latest patent from Honda, this is, uh, suggests the aim isn't to have a bike that assumes complete control, but one that can take an element of control from the rider, either to give them a break or prevent an accident. Honda's new patent is a huge step forward. It combines cameras, radar and LiDAR with a series of automatic controls, including throttle, braking and steering. Altogether, the tech endows the bike with the same level of semi-autonomous ability as some of the, uh, some of the very latest high-end cars. Throughout all this, the rider is intended to be in overall control, with the system stepping in to help only when needed. So what do you think of this? Patent um, gone out by Honda. Um, obviously, they have to register patents. We have to move on. Technology moves on. So I'm not surprised that they're doing this. But I have to say, to me, this just sounds horrible. The, th the thought of your bike taking over when it thinks you're about to do something it doesn't like is just horrible. Um, who knows? Oh, this ain't going to be around anytime soon. If we see this in 10 years' time, I'll be amazed. But uh, I'll be very interested to have a go with it and see what it feels like. But for me, this is just too much. This is a bit of tech that I can do without. What do you think? Stick some comments below about whether you'd like a bike that steers you out of danger if you get into it. I mean, the theory of it sounds fine, doesn't it? Who wouldn't, wouldn't want to be taken out of danger? Who doesn't want a bit of safety? But the whole point of riding a bike is you're in control, isn't it? I don't know. Anyway, I don't like the sound of that one. 
Right, talking point, yeah, there's a letter here that I just um, put by an email actually from a fellow called Steve Wood. Uh, Cruise control, no thanks. Each to their own, he says, uh, but I'll never understand the armchair and slipper brigade who frequent motorways and dual carriageways, it's me, I'm armchair and slipper, um, who frequent motorways and dual carriageways to go all the way to Dayton and Sorini to their touring destination with only a fuel stop, rather than research great A and B roads and plan their journey to get somewhere on this fantastic island of ours. Tell us that enough where you want to go and specify those exciting looking routes you want to reuse rather than let it tell you roads what roads to take as if you were at the wheel of a car or a truck. Okay, I get that. So I think he's having a bit of a dig at Satnav generally, which actually I think is a brilliant thing on a bike if you're going touring, uh, but also uh, not blatting to your destination, which is usually what I do. So for example, this trip that I just did, um, that I keep mentioning, um, the idea was to get to Luxembourg because the uh, I've been I've heard before, but never been to Luxembourg, that there are some great riding roads there. And there are indeed, as you'll see on my videos. Uh, and the plan was to basically get out of England and through Northern France where the roads are fine, but not that exciting, uh, and into the more interest, interesting stuff around the forests of Belgium and then into uh, Luxembourg as soon as possible. So that's what we did. We had one day of um, you know, a 300 mile plat, wasn't very exciting, but then the rest of our six, seven day break, we enjoyed really nice roads. So I, I personally love that. So, I mean, everyone to his own, fair enough. Um, but certainly I like to black somewhere and then and then ride around the area. Um, Steve obviously doesn't, but I'd be interested again, what the balance is of my viewers. Do you prefer to get where you're going and then enjoy the roads or do you make the whole uh, the whole tour, uh, you know, part of the enjoyment if you, if you, you, you know what I'm trying to say? Didn't put that very well, but do you make all the tour on interesting roads or do you just black lot like I do? You get what I mean anyway. Just let me know below. Okay, last story on MCM before we move on to a couple from Adventure Bike Rider magazine. Burning Bright Triumph Tigers 1200 is a brand new beast, but does it live up to the hype? Now, if you remember, when this came out, Triumph said that this was better in every way than pretty much all other adventure bikes. And it was it was aimed at the GS, what they were saying. They were saying it was lighter, faster, cheaper, better equipped, etc. And I have to say, I, I really do love the looks of the bike. I've yet to see one in the flesh, but I am going to be borrowing one at the end of this month. In fact, on the 30th of May, uh, I shall be getting one of these for two week test so I will be bringing you my thoughts on this bike and I cannot wait so I don't want to get biased by what people say but uh, as you also know I'm a massive uh, GS fanboy and uh, I just think the way that bike is balanced is, is brilliant so I would and, and knowing what the old Tiger 1200 was like which frankly was a bit lardy and way too top heavy for me a bike I really didn't like very much although on paper it sounded good um, I'm I, you know I've got high hopes for the new Triumph Tiger 1200 but I'd be surprised um, if it is as good as the GS anyway let's see what um, let's see what uh, um, MCN say, I'll, I'll highlight something here. The new 1200 has nothing in common with the predecessors apart from the name, which I think is, is a good move. Um, the verdict here, the Tiger 1200 Rally Pro is just another great machine. Uh, oh, sorry, the Tiger 1200 Rally Pro is yet another great machine from Triumph. Actually, it's better than that. It's fabulous. Well, that's great. That's good news. Uh, it's not perfect. Vibrations are too apparent on a long straight ride, and despite the suspension's brilliance, I suspect an R1250 GS as a slightly plusher ride. However, the new Tiger 1200 is damn close to the GS all-round genius. More importantly, it's far and away the best Tiger ever. Well, I would have thought more importantly was how it stacks up to the GS. But anyway, uh, no doubt it's probably the best Tiger 1200 ever. It looks lovely, and it sounds like it comes close. Again, they're giving it four stars out of five. £17,700 for the Triumph Tiger 1200 Rally Pro. It is a handsome-looking bike. I really want to like this bike. Um, because I've got no allegiance to any particular brand. I, I, you know, I love British bikes, and I would love to, you know as and when I come to replace my GS, if the Triumph Tiger 1200 is, um, you know, I think it's better than I'll get one of those. Um, it's shaft drive, which is brilliant. Cannot wait to uh, have a ride on it uh, next month and then I'll be bringing you videos probably in the month after. So stick around, stay tuned to the channel for that if you're interested in the Tiger 1200. All right, now I do occasionally get, or every other month, I get an Adventure Bike Rider magazine. Great magazine, slightly different to other magazines I've come across. Focuses mainly on things like where can you ride, adventure riding, um, stories of people that go far and wide. So not so much bike reviews and stuff, although they do cover some. And I see they've got the new Ducati Desert X or 10 on the cover here. A couple of things I've pulled out here. First off, uh, the Masterclass 10. This is the ABR Festival, which is coming up on the 24th to the 26th of June. I've mentioned it before, but what amused me about this here is it says here, the Harley Davidson Campfire. Let me read you what it says here. If you could gather for a cosy chat with your favorite round the world travelers, authors, and YouTube stars, what would you ask them? Well, get your thinking cap on, because you can do just that at the Harley Davidson Campfire uh, tent. So pull up a chair, kick back with a drink, and talk all things motorcycle travel with the likes of the Missenden Flyer, Moto Bob, 
uh, Mick Hextance, uh, Billy Ward, uh, Vanessa Ruck, Nathan Will Millward and others. It's the perfect opportunity to get to know your adventure biking heroes. Well, that's fantastic. I was just chuffed that they put me above that list of other great riders. So uh, thank you for ABR for having me along once again uh, to the, uh, it's be like a Q&A thing in the Harley Davidson campfire tent. Don't know what day I'm doing it yet, but uh, if you go to the ABR festival, do come and say hello and, and give me some uh, heckling in the tent. That would be good. Uh, there are tickets still available, I think. And if you use the code TMF5, you can get 5% off. So it'd be great to meet you there. It's going to be a great laugh. Lots of great people going. I'm going for the whole weekend. Um, I know Richie Vida's there. I know Teapot's there. Uh, and Ryan from Fort Nine is there as well. I cannot wait to meet him, as well as all sorts of other stuff. But those are the guys that I'm looking forward to seeing. So I'll see you there if you're going. All right, next story here. Uh, Triumph Tiger 1200, here we go. So um, obviously it's just been launched and the press um, launch has happened, uh, which I think I did get invited on, but I, I tend to not go, well, I never go on press launches as a matter of, of policy. Um, but anyway, ABR did and uh, they've ridden the bike too. So I'm just interested to see what their verdict is compared with uh, what MCN just said. So they said the Hinkley team has taken a tired but reliable performer and transformed it into one of the best adventure bikes that ABR has tested for quite a while. So they obviously like it. If you're looking to buy a premium adventure bike, the choice just got a whole lot harder. Brilliant, okay. And they've said here's a weekend tour. It's hard to imagine a better bike to help you leave the city behind at weekends and go exploring, one or two up. The Tiger was made for adventures big or small. As an off-roader, the 900 Tiger was good, but the 1200 may well be better. As a continental tourer, this Tiger is everything you could possibly need to travel. So they do like it. They don't say, actually, in the article, if you read the whole thing, it doesn't say how it stacks up against the GS, which is, the again, the obvious competitor. So I will draw my own conclusions when I borrow it, but ABR certainly liked it as well. All the reviews I've seen on videos and read in magazines and papers have all said it's a great bike, so I thoroughly expect to like it. All righty. That's it for uh, the news for this month, then, which means it's time for our brand new feature... <sighs> yep, Reader's Rise, and uh, well, I say brand new, we did it last month for the first time, it seemed to go down alright, so thank you to everybody that sent in pictures of their bikes and a little bit of a backstory uh, with uh, what their bike is about, so we could share them and nose that, and this is just intended for us to be a bit nosy looking at other people's machines, the sort of thing you'd do if you saw a motorcycle in the cub pub car park and got talking to the owner, this is the sort of chat you might have. Anyway, let's start with something a little bit different. This is Ian Preston's Can-Am Spider. Now, this is a bit controversial because I know that uh, some people don't regard trikes and things like the Spider as motorcycles, and of course they're not, they're trikes. Um, but anyway, let's, let's tell you what uh, Ian says. Here's my story. I used to ride a GS in a Bonneville, but after recently being diagnosed with stage four cancer, ooh, sorry to hear that, uh, Ian, um, and as it was in my bones and that fractures were to be avoided, I took the decision to sell both bikes, dig into my savings and buy a truck. I look at the obvious ones, but I looked at the obvious ones, but I was attracted to the Canon Spider, so I went out and purchased one after 44 years of riding two wheels, which he says included the Goldwing. Uh, it's taken a while to get used to it, but I'm getting there. It's got it's a 2018 model. This one, it's got a 1330cc Rotax engine. I know Rotax engines, particularly from my flying hobby. Uh, it's got a six-speed semi-automatic gearbox. You change up, but it changes down on its own. How bizarre is that? How weird! I wonder what the logic is behind that. Uh, it's got a single rear brake paddle, which operates all three Brembo brakes. Full speed reverse gear, that could be fun. Uh, I've added a few extras to make it my own, but hope that's uh, different enough for you. So yeah, thank you Ian, uh, very much for sending that. It certainly is something very different. I've never ridden one of these. Uh, I think they look quite cool. You don't see them much in this country. I guess they're more, uh, well, probably in Canada and places like that, but uh, so sorry to hear about your cancer as well, Ian, but thank you very much indeed for sending in uh, the picture of your splendid can -Am Spider. All right, next up. Rob Bike Bob's Suzuki GS500. Now, I've included this because this uh, is, okay, uh, a few years ago, they were everywhere, uh, GS500s. I mean, you know, this is a GS, isn't it? But it's a Suzuki GS500. This was the bike that I passed my test on, or a standard GS500. Anyway, I thought it was the gruntiest, meanest bike uh, ever. And at that time, it was the only big bike I'd ever ridden. Anyway, this is what Rob says about his. Here's my modest Suzuki GS500 from 1994, but it's only got 16,000 miles on it. I made it into a mild scrambler type thing, but resisted the fashion of Nobblies as I love to ride it reasonably hard. Oh, should have gone for Nobblies. Love a Nobbly me. I used to have big bikes, but found they were getting far too heavy for me and I was riding far too quickly. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean, Rob. The Suzuki cost me £900. What a bargain. It's cheap to run and I can thrash it while staying at legal speeds. It's loads of fun and I don't have to be precious about it, Rob. Yeah, brilliant. Great that, Rob. Uh, love the bike. Uh, lots of happy memories 
uh, on a GS500 for me, and I completely agree. Uh, great to have a bike that doesn't cost much to run, and you can just enjoy the riding, isn't it? Not to be said for older bikes. We'll come on to that later. All right, next up, a couple of bikes here. A lady from, I think, Sweden called Sanna Forsland has sent me in a picture of uh, a number of her bikes, but here I'm featuring her MT10 and Ovale GP2. Uh, she says, Hi, I'm, I'm a bike-loving woman from Sweden. Thanks for a great show. Thank you for watching. I have got so many, uh, so few female viewers, I'm, I'm chuffed that you're watching. Thank you, Sanna. Um, you should really have a go on my lovely MT10. I'd love to. The MT10 she's got is highly modified. Uh, she says, I have some travelling plans for Great Britain next year if everything goes to plan. And if you ever travel to Sweden, don't hesitate to swing by. Think of it as a date. Uh, no, she didn't say that. I said, don't think of it as a date. That's a bit, that's a bit scary, isn't it? Anyway. Thanks very much for the offer. Uh, anyway, she's got uh, this highly modified MT10, and she's got a custom bobber dragster and an Ovale GP2, which are these bikes I'm showing you here. She's also got a Duke 690, but uh, I thought I wouldn't let her hog the whole of uh, the whole of Reader's Rise. But uh, yeah, lovely looking bikes, these Sana. You're obviously uh, a bit of a, a bike nutter, uh, and some quite different machines there as well. I like the I like the fact that you've got such a different spread of bikes as well. Similar thing to what I try and do, and have different types of bikes. So thank you for sending those in, Sana. Right. Next up, Motor Gym's 2019 Janus or Janus Halcyon 250. Now, when I first saw this, I thought, blimey, this is something out of, you know, the 1920s. And that, of course, is what it's intended to do. I did a little bit of research uh, and found out that actually these are brand new bikes that are built in the US uh, and they're built to look like old bikes. So Jim says here, featherbed frame with Earl's fork and Springer seat made by a small manufacturer in Goshen, Indiana, US. Uh, metalwork and leather are handcrafted by the Amish. The engine is a Chonda air cooled 250 source from Lifan, so I think that's a Chinese engine. Uh, a real pleasure to cruise down country lanes at 40 to 50 miles an hour. Feels like a proper distinguished gentleman from the 1920s. Yeah, it looks properly authentic, doesn't it? I'd love a go on that. Uh, you'll only get stopped by the police for conversation, so your license is safe. What a brilliant thing. Uh, and if you want to buy one of these, I think they're only available in the US. They're $8,500 new, so not a lot of money for something that's handcrafted uh, and I think, uh, and is so different to anything else. So what a brilliant bike. So thank you so much, uh, Motor Gym, for sending that in. Really interesting looking bike love it glad uh, to see uh, that you're riding something a bit different as well all right last one then for this uh, reader's rides biker steph and she's got a classic bmw k75 look at this beast i uh, thought you might like to see some pictures of my classic bmw k75 i've had the bike for about eight years but before that it belonged to my father who bought it back in 1992 when it was only six years old the bike has covered about 150,000 miles. These things go forever. And it still starts on the button every time. It's the smoothest bike I've ever ridden. I had the bike resprayed about four years ago back to the original BMW color, and it looks epic, doesn't it? And also color coded the panniers and top box. Here are some before and after pictures. Let me know what you think. Well, I think it looks great, Stefan. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, sorry, Stefan. So uh, I think I said biker Steph, assuming you were a woman. I take that back. Stefan is usually a lad, isn't it? Anyway, lovely looking bike, Stefan. Thank you for sending that in. Uh, it looks great in that color scheme as well. Um, yeah, great. Stuff. So if you've got a bike that you might think is of interest to other uh, viewers of bike news, send them in to me. Send them to uh, themissendonflyer at gmail.com. Uh, if you can include uh, two or three pictures, ideally in landscape format, brilliant if they're in sort of uh, 1080 type uh, format about anything as long as it's kind of landscape better quality the better uh, and uh, I'll have a look and uh, you might feature in a in a future readers rise I've got quite a few sent in to me uh, so I've got quite a backlog but don't worry I'm not doing them in any particular order I'm keeping them all thank you to everybody that sent them in if you haven't seen yours yet you might see it in a future uh, review so again yeah thanks for sending those in keep them coming all right that can mean only one thing it's time for You got it? Parish notices. What's coming up on the channel in the next uh, few days or over the next month between now and the next bike news? Well, I'll tell you. So the next video coming up uh, next Wednesday is my report from the Bike Shed Custom Motorcycle Show, which I'm at. If you're watching this when the video comes out on Saturday, I'm actually there today on Saturday. So uh, if you're at the Bike Shed Show and you didn't come and say hello and you saw me, shame on you. Come and say hello if you see me at the Bike Shed Show, uh, if you're going later and you watch this in the morning. Um, so yeah, I'm there at Tobacco Dock with Mrs. Flora as well. So, uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And uh, hopefully I'll just take some sort of eavesdropping-y type uh, video. I've never been to the bike shed or a custom bike show before feeling a little bit out of place so we'll see how that goes uh, and I'll stick a video up on that. I've got another classic review coming for you. They seem to come down, go down well. This came out on June the 4th. Uh, this time is the mighty Yamaha XJR 1300 which those nice folks at Superbike Factory have kindly loaned me. So I've got my review of the XJR 1300 coming up. You're going to like that one. 8th of June is my final ride on the Triumph Speed Triple 1200 RR. This is the one with the big fairing. My sort of final thoughts on that bike. Saturday the 11th of June I at last get to try that new uh, we talked about a lot in this review, the Triumph Type 
Tiger 1200. I cannot wait for that. So the video coming up, where well, it's scheduled for the 11th of June. I haven't ridden the bike or made the video yet, but I've got a slot for it then, so look out for that one. From June the 15th, will be, again, not made them yet, but I've made them film them, haven't edited them yet, but the brand new Tour Sauris, uh, Tour Sauris? Tour Series. Uh, me and my mates <coughs> uh, riding through Europe on the Goldwing to Luxembourg for a bit of an explore. Uh, great, we had a great time. Weather was largely kind to us. We did have a bit of rain on the way back, but uh, yeah, really enjoyed being out on the bike, touring again, using the Goldwing for what it was invented for. If you want to join us for that tour series, then that starts on June the 15th. Now, I've got a question for you. I'm thinking, I don't know yet, but there may be three or four episodes of that, about 20 minutes each. Do you want me to run them one after the other, so Saturday, Wednesday, Saturday, Wednesday, or would you rather I intersperse those with other videos, so some bike reviews, that sort of thing? I usually intersperse them with other videos, but then I get people comment and say oh where's part two or whatever because it doesn't run like that but I'm thinking this time I might run them one after the other and see how that does I'm not sure that will impact the channel but I'm going to give it a try let me know if you've got any thoughts one way or the other on that but anyway first one of that tour series provided I get my finger out and edit it coming up June the 15th then on the 25th of June another classic review this time uh, hopefully the super blackbird from Honda again I haven't ridden this one this is one of those Hayabusa killers uh, back from uh, well I think probably well, I don't know when it was from actually, around the uh, turn of the, the turn of the century. That sounds good, doesn't it? Looking forward to ride that. Lots of it was said you're gonna have to ride a super blackbird. So that's coming hopefully next week, and I'll get that uh, review out for you on the 25th of June. I've also got a video comparing the Tracer 7 with the Triumph Tiger Sport 660. So if you're in that middleweight tourer, do it all type market, then I'll give you my thoughts on how those two, what I think are the leading bikes in that category, compare. Uh, I've got a review of my Panigale Comfort Seat. I, I uh, promised that to you a while back. I don't do reviews of things like seats very often, uh, but um, I did say I would bring you that. I promised that to you. Some people had asked for it, so I've got a review of the Panigale Comfort Seat coming up, and maybe more as well. Might do a few vlogs, not sure. Depends how things go. So quite, quite a busy month ahead. Um, next bike news, a little bit later than normal. That's going to be uh, on or around the 6th of July, so there'll be loads to go through then. There'll probably be five copies of MCN to go through. So look out for the next bike news, 6th of July. Okay, so uh, that's pretty much it. As ever, thank you to all my patrons and my sponsors for uh, everything that you do for the channel. Without you guys, I could not run this channel in the way that I do, so thank you to those. And of course, thank you very much indeed for keep watching the videos. Uh, without you, there would be nothing at all, so thank you for that. All right, that's it for this Bike News. Look forward to speaking to you again soon. Until then, this has been Mr. Flyer. Cheerio.